Okay, this. Excuse me, teachers, please excuse the second hour jazz band students that are going to be a little lighter coming to class now. Thank you. Okay, this is Mr. This is the uh, a lecture for my third hour class on April the 28th. Okay, well, we were talking about why the Roaring Twenties were called the Roaring Twenties. And uh, one of the reasons, one, you know, the economy's great. You have the lost generation, these jaded, depressed young people who believe that World War I had ruined their lives. And their attitude is, you know, there's really no purpose to life. Just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Uh, and then you had a great change in morality. Morality, I'll say again, is what a society, and by the way, morality all over the world is different. If you think that people uh, all over the world hold the same moral values that we do in the United States, all I can say to you is you'd better get out and travel uh, a little bit and see the world. Morality is what people think is right and wrong, and every society decides what they think right is wrong, and morality always changes. Morality always changes. Well, it changed in the 20s. There was jazz music. There was this wild music that kids were listening to, uh, that parents were shocked over. Uh, women wore, uh, there are women, you know, in 1910, women would have never, that, that, that's, those are 1910 bathing suits, 1920 bathing suits, by the way. Women would have never gone to the beach exposing their legs and their arms and their necks that way. Uh, in 1910, but 10 years later, it was common in America. They're smoking in public. That was just absolutely shocking that a woman would smoke at those girls. Uh, you know, they're raising their skirts are short to begin with compared to what it had been at the end of World War I. A woman's skirts went down to her shoe tops. Look at that. You know, they've cut their hair off. You know, women had, uh, it's a sign of rebellion. Uh, you know, uh, every generation has their sign of rebellion. Uh, to shock their elders. Well, you know, that's just what teenagers do. And uh, they had had these long flowing locks of hair their mothers and fathers were so proud of. They're going to cut them off short and dye them black, okay? It's all to shock the parents. And to get this down, you had the new woman, okay? That's what they call them, the new women. Women acted differently than they ever had before. And by the way, you can say that about any generation, but they acted differently than they ever had before. Uh, America became an urban nation in the 1920s. That's important for you to write down too. Starting in 1865, uh, at the end of the Civil War, America had been marching. An urban nation means this. There are more Americans that lived in cities than out on the farm. Uh, in 1865, about 60% of Americans lived on the farm, maybe a little more than that. But, but for the first time in 1921, for the first time in 1921, 51%, that's a majority, 51% of Americans now lived in cities. 51% of Americans now lived in cities. And a lot of those were women. And the thing that drew people to the cities, jobs, the Industrial Revolution, jobs still going on. And for the first time in their lives, women found themselves independent. And they had their own apartment. They had their own job. They had their own income. Uh, they were not under the control of any male relative. Off in these small towns and out on the farm, a woman was almost the property. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not much. Women were almost the property of their oldest male relative. You were the property of your father until you married. Then you became the property of your husband. If you never married, when your father died, an uncle took over. When he died, your brother took over. Your lives were controlled by men. Now women, for the first time, are free. They're making their own decisions, many of them. And again, out of this, living independently, out from under their sh the shadow of their parents, you know, you will all experience this when you go out into the world. You're going to be making your own decisions. You're going to decide when you get up and when you go to bed. Of course, your job will decide that. But when you get up, you're going to be making your own decisions. You're going to have mom, dad, and teachers and all these people. Very shortly, this is going to happen unless you live at home until you're 40. I can't imagine that. But more and more people seem to be doing that. But still, if you become independent, you'll be making your own choices. And you're going to make good choices and you're going to make bad choices. You're going to do things you're proud of and you're going to do things you regret. And so did these women that went to the city, to the big cities. Uh, they never had enjoyed this kind of freedom. And so here comes what in the 20s is called the new woman or the flappers, okay? that's what These are flappers right here. These are women that are on their own. They're living large. I don't know. 
today you might call it girls gone wild. And women did things for the first time that had always been reserved for men. They drank and smoked. They drove automobiles. You understand that in Saudi Arabia, women have only been allowed to drive automobiles for the, in the last five years. It was against the law. They could be arrested for driving an automobile. Culture and morals are different everywhere in the world. But women could drive an automobile. Women could attend college in large numbers. By the way, the majority of people getting a college degree and it's growing. The male on the campuses are, is becoming, they're becoming extinct. The vast majority, of the, well, I won't say the vast, but I think something like 60% of all college students, all people that get a college degree in this country are women, not males. That's changed. In the 1920s, just the fact that you were a woman might uh, uh, preclude, preclude you from being admit, admitted to law school or uh, medical school. Well, now uh, these things are starting to open up. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, get this down in the 20s, drug use increased. All the drugs we have today, heroin, cocaine, marijuana. Of course, in the 20s, marijuana was legal. Marijuana doesn't become illegal until 1937. <clears throat> get this down, abortions were on the rise. Premarital sex, that's sex between people who aren't married. And the reason there was a rise in premarital sex is that in the 1920s, birth control was more readily available. When young soldiers marched off to the Civil War in 1861, they were followed by swarms of prostitutes. There were whorehouses all over Washington, D.C. That's where the main Northern Army was. <coughs> Abraham Lincoln could look out of the White House in any direction and see a house of prostitution. And right next door, there would be an abortion mill because there was birth control. They sold condoms. Condoms, you could buy... A, condom, a soldier was paid $16 a month. You could buy a, a condom for, uh, you could buy five condoms for $6. He's paid $16 a month, five condoms, because uh, making condoms was a long and laborious thing. They were made out of sheep intestines. And it took a lot to make condoms out of sheep intestines. Therefore, they were very expensive. By the 1920s, a new invention. Here we go, industrial revolution, latex condoms, same condoms you have today. Uh, they cost 10 cents each. And so guess what? With more readily available birth control, uh, premarital sex went sky high. When premarital sex went sky high, guess what? In the 1920s, abortion, which was illegal. It's legal today. It's legal right now. What's the name of the case in 1973 that legalized abortion? It's pretty important. Roe v. Wade, remember that? Roe v. Wade, yes. I saw the other day that like men made something up for in Oklahoma, they made it illegal. Yeah, the Oklahoma State Legislature's passed a law that's saying that, that abortion is illegal, but what that hinges on is if the U.S. if the Supreme Court, there's a case from Texas. Texas also passed a law like that. And that and people have challenged that in Texas, and it's gone all the way to the Supreme Court. Roe v. Wade, a woman has had the right. You raise a good point. A woman has had the right to a safe and legal abortion for the last 50 years. And I thought that was settled law. I thought it would never be overturned. But now you've got a very conservative court. And uh, Roe v. Wade is being challenged. And this summer, before you get back to school next year, the right of a woman to have an abortion may be overturned. And what they will do is they will go back to if that, if that happens. If, if, if the court declares the case of Roe v. Wade is, uh, Wade is unkind, and courts can do that. Courts can go back and declare something that was 50 as unconstitutional. It'll go back to a state option. Uh, you may not be able to get an, an abortion in, uh, in uh, Oklahoma or Texas or Louisiana or Alabama or Mississippi or Georgia, the traditional conservative states, but you may be able to go. I remember before there was Roe v. Wade, girls went to California. It was one of the few states where abortion was legal. It's a state option. But that's a tremendous burden for a woman. So they went all the way to California? Sure they did. They had to. Or they went to Mexico. Or they went to Canada, uh, maybe Massachusetts. Yeah, very few states. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the way it was before Roe v. Wade. And by the way, this summer it may become that way again. And if it does, that law that, that you mentioned that they passed over in the Oklahoma State Legislature and Governor Stitt has signed into law, then that will take effect in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, uh, abortions will be illegal. But it's, of course, on the other hand, it's kind of like the drug war. You know, drugs, we fought a drug war for 50 years and spent trillions of dollars. Is there any drug that they're selling on the streets of Chicago that I couldn't get 
in Eufaula if I, by four o'clock today if I wanted to, not A1. So passing laws, that's one thing, enforcing is something else. Of course, the danger of that is now a woman can get a safe and legal abortion. Uh, if you live in, if, if Roe v. Wade is overturned and you find yourself in a state like Oklahoma, then, you know, if you don't have the wherewithal to go to California or go to some state where it's legal, then you have to go to some back alley butcher. And he may rupture a blood vessel while he's removing that fetus, and it may cause you to bleed. That that's the way it was before Roe v. Wade, and we may be going back to that this summer. Watch the, the watch the news, huh? I saw in the movie Dirty Dancing. It was like um, you saw on the what? You know what the movie Dirty Dancing? No. Oh, it's an old. Movie. I happen to miss that. Yeah, it's an old movie, and they had. Well, we'll just take a day off and watch it. You've this piqued my a, interest. This girl had an abortion. And she got it cut out. She wasn't like, and the same thing happened. Yeah. Well, that's why women, when you see them, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I lived through all that. That's why women, when they're in front of the Supreme Court protesting to keep abortion legal, they hold up coat hangers and start a coat. Women drank, uh, desperate women whose boyfriends had abandoned them and they just couldn't bring themselves to tell their parents, you know, living in a little town, uh, they drank Clorox thinking it would, you know, cause a self-induced abortion and they killed themselves. Yeah, it's, it was, it was, yeah. And Roe v. Wade made, <coughs> you know, I, I, I get so tired of people saying, well, you know, I'm not going to vote for that guy because he's for abortion. Listen, nobody's for, or I've never heard of anybody say, oh, so I'll go get an abortion. It's a wonderful experience. It's like a day at the beach. I've never heard of anybody that's for abortion. But what people who are pro-choice are saying is women ought to have that choice. Women ought to control their bodies, okay? Uh, that's I'm just giving you the pro-choice argument. Uh, but uh, And the pro-choice choice argument has prevailed in this country for the last 50 years. But again, that may come to a screeching halt in places like Oklahoma. You know, who knows like, what... Huh? I feel like in some situations, it's good, and then in some situations, they're just being dumb. Well, and this Oklahoma bill you're talking about, to your point says that abortions will be illegal except where the life of the mother is in danger. Yeah. If your doctor tells you if you have this baby, you will die, then the mother gets to make that decision according to the law that they pass. Yeah. So anyway, rape uh, is another one. Inc if you become pre incest, you know. Uh, yeah, they, they put some provisions in there. But, but, the, but the point is, uh, well, anyway, uh, we'll see how that turns out. Uh, but abortion was on the rise in the 1920s. It was an issue. This is nothing new. By the way, church attendance declined. Church attendance declined. A lot of these things are reminiscent of today. Well, of course, when there were people in America, got this down, who looked at this situation, get this down, there were people that looked at this situation in America especially the rise of drug use. You understand that there were seven people in this country that were alive when this lecture started. And by the time the bell rings for you to leave, they will be as dead as a doornail from Oxycontin. That's just one drug, Oxycontin. Seven people every hour die in this country from abusing Oxycontin. Yeah. So people looked at that. <clears throat> and then we've been fighting a drug war for 50 years. By the way, it's failed miserably. Why has the drug war failed? What? You can't stop. Why can't you? That's what I'm asking. Why can't you stop it? The government's been trying to spend trillions of dollars. We, if we had, if we had that trillions of dollars back, we might could pay your health care, your way to college, your trade school, or loan you. Well, I don't know. When you graduate from high school, Mr. McNeely, loan you three hundred thousand dollars to start a business. If we had that back, but we don't have it back. It's all gone, and the drug war has failed. And why has it failed? Well, yeah, what you're saying, here's the short version of what you just said. We want drugs. That's exactly right. You know, talking about building walls, you know, the drugs are coming across, the fentanyl's coming across the Mexican border. By the way, just for the record, where do most drugs enter the United States from? Not the Mexican border, through our seaports, New Orleans and Los Angeles. That's where they're coming through. Uh, you can build walls. You can seal off the seaports and we will get drugs because we want them. We consume more drugs. We're the country that, you know, we ought to have one of those big fingers. We're number one. 
uh, we're the number one consumer of drugs. We want them. I was telling the last hour class, I've never yet been driving down the road anywhere in this great and free republic and seen some fair-haired American boy down on his knees with two Mexican drug lords. They've got a pistol to each head, and one of them is holding a marijuana joined in front of him, laced with fentanyl, saying, smoke it. You know, don't be a smoke it. No, that's not the, you know, we want it. We want it. And until we don't want them anymore, we'll still have them. Uh, the drug wars fail. And I want to talk to you about an early drug war, prohibition. Write that down. Uh, uh, you know, because with, with, that, with this perceived uh, decline of morals, the forces of morality said we've got to stop this decline in morals. And we're going to start. We're going to outlaw alcohol. Get this down. Prohibition. The root word is prohibit. <coughs> <coughs> Prohibition. The 1920s, here's something else about it. It is the era of prohibition. Prohibition outlawed alcohol. It was illegal to have alcohol. Having a, alcohol. <laughs> Having a six pack of beer in your refrigerator would be just, it was just as illegal in the 1920s as having several bags of cocaine in your refrigerator. Okay. You could be arrested and you could go to jail. America was officially dry. Get this down. You know, if you uh, were opposed to drinking, you were considered to be a dry. By the way, in Texas and Arkansas, there are a couple of dry counties. I've been in them in Texas. I don't, uh, you can't buy any alcohol in that county. It's against the law to this very day. Dry. And if you were in favor of alcohol, making it legal, you were a wet. Well, America became officially dry. Get this down. From 1919 until 1933. You notice I didn't say it became dry because after Prohibition was passed, there was more drinking in this country than there had been before. All you have to do to make something popular is say you can't do it. And people just have to go try it out. So there was more drinking in this country after Prohibition than there was before. Uh, the Congress in 1919, get this down, passed the 18th Amendment. Get all this information down. The 18th Amendment. And the 18th Amendment outlawed liquor in America. You couldn't produce it. You couldn't manufacture it. You couldn't sell it. <clears throat> so why is Good China Day still it's not. You can go right over here to the extreme liquor store and buy moonshine. Making it yourself. Hmm? Like why is it making it yourself? Well, that's a good question because when alcohol became legal, uh, the government controlled it and taxed it. And if you're running a still in your bathtub, they can't tax it. They can't tax it. You know, these agents you see in some of the movies, you know, the hillbillies are all back in the sticks running their still and they always say, now, Jeb, you stay here. We're going to go to town. You stay here. But watch out for them revenueers. Revenue, that's tax. They're trying to find, destroy your still because you're not paying taxes on it. Okay, but, but, but people legally make moonshine, what they used to call corn whiskey. Stay away from it. Anyway, it's my advice. Anyway. So uh, during World War I, get this down. So all this started in World War I. In World War One, there was, uh, you remember we talked about, there was an effort to conserve food, remember that? And so what's alcohol made out of? Corn. Corn and what? Well, eating in the Depression, they made that all. I had to drink potato whiskey, good God. Uh, corn, grain, okay, alpha hops and grains you make there. You add some hops, one scotch or bourbon or just uh, straight whiskey, you make it out of grain, corn, okay? And, of course, there was an effort to serve, to, to, to save food, if you remember that, in World War One. So the prohibitionists, the people who had been, get this down, the people who had been fighting for years for prohibition said, aha, you know, this is a door of opportunity for us. They said, hey, the government wants to conserve food. What's the food that runs America? Corn. So to save corn, let's just have, get this down, let's just have temporary, let's just have, let's just outlaw alcohol production for the war, just for the war, okay? 
And they persuaded the Congress to pass a law called the Ballstead Act. Okay, get this down, the Ballstead Act. And it became law in 1918. Well, the war ended in 1918. And the Ballstead Act, look, there's just a direct connection. The Ballstead Act morphed into the 18th Amendment. It had enough support. You with me? It had enough support by 19... Uh, 19 to get it added to the Constitution, the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. And, everybody with me, and Prohibition will last from 1919 to 1933 uh, when the 18th Amendment will be replaced by the 21st. Okay, and the 21st Amendment, and I'm not going to ask you all those amendments, but the, I just want you to, the 21st Amendment legalized booze again. But again, it was on a state option. You with me? It was on a state option. When they said booze is legal, it was up to each state. How long? Oklahoma, booze became legal again in 1933. When did? When could you buy a can of beer legally in Oklahoma? Not until 1959, the year I started kindergarten. Yeah, you could buy beer. And by the way, it couldn't be six-point beer. It had to be three-two beer, watered-down beer. Oklahoma was dry for a long time after Prohibition. You understand? After Prohibition went away. So anyway, uh, America became dry. And a lot of people supported this, you know. The government just set a date and said on that day at midnight, all bars have to close, all breweries, distilleries have to close, no more booze in America. And a lot of people supported that. Churches supported that. Wives supported it. They didn't want their husband getting paid on Friday. And he said, I'll just go in the saloon here and have one with the boys. And by midnight, he had drunk up the rent and all the money they had for food. And so why a lot of wives supported it. Um, uh, a lot of employers. You know, there was a thing in America called Blue Monday absenteeism. We really did have an alcohol problem. Blue Monday absenteeism. You know, employers were hesitant to pay their employees on Friday because they would go get drunk and, Monday, they all still had a terrible hangover, so they'd call in and say, I'm sick. And that caused millions of hours of loss of production in this country. So a lot of employers said, um, prohibition prohibition is a good thing. Uh, and when, when the 18th Amendment, you know, uh, you know and, 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 and let me say this, religious leaders rightfully so, rightfully so, pointed out, the role that alcohol and other drugs played in poverty, child abuse, divorce, destruction of the family. So all these groups supported prohibition. And when it finally passed, one prohibitionist predicted that with the passage of the 18th Amendment, uh, and I quote, the poor house will vanish. For, there won't be any more poor people. Uh, prohibition will solve all of our problems. Society's problems would all go away. Well, to an extent it worked especially out here in rural areas, drinking at first, get this down, and declined, mostly in rural. But, but as you point out, Mr. McDavid, there were people, you know, you make something illegal, and there's always someone who's going to provide it for you. And uh, what, were those, <clears throat> what were those guys that ran those stills called? Moon, <clears throat> moonshiners? Why were they called? Them? Why did they make their booze at night? Well, no, they they were you know they did it at night. So so yeah, so the federal agents couldn't find them. They they brewed their <coughs> whiskey by the light of the moon. They were bootleggers. You know the idea that a guy would wear these high boots and he would stuff all these little half pints of whiskey in there and he would come to your town and you know you could go over the corner and he'd see, slip him some money and he would slip you some uh, some booze. Okay, the bootlegger. But as you point out, the problem with all of this and the reason that prohibition failed was that the government was attempting to outlaw America's chief recreational drug. That's why we're about to legalize marijuana, because marijuana is legal, uh, rapidly becoming America's chief, chief recreational drug. It was legal until 1937. In 1933, as you can see right here, we made booze legal. And then four years later, I don't know whether to soothe our conscience or what, we took marijuana which was, had been legal for 20,000 years, we took marijuana and it became illegal. You understand that cocaine was illegal until 1914. If you went to the dentist, uh, you know, and I wouldn't mind this today, and I've never used marijuana or cocaine, but I, they would just, every doctor, every dentist had 
cocaine in his back. And he would just rub some on your gum and the whole side of your head. I hate needles. I hate them. I can't stand it. Especially if somebody would give me a shot in the mouth. And if you ever go to a clinic where I go to to get a blood test, don't mention my name or they'll throw you out and slam the door behind you because I am absolutely evil when they start coming toward me with a needle. I just say, get away from me. You know, I don't, you know, I'm crawling the walls. So, I, you know, they just hate me and all the clinics, right? So don't ever mention my name. They'll double charge you or something. But anyway, I wouldn't mind if they put some cocaine on there and pull that tooth. You know, and they just had a detox room over there. And you know, I could go lay down and, you know, think I was the king of Bulgaria or Napoleon. They'd come back a couple of hours and say, you, you still think you're uh, Napoleon? I would say, don't bother me. I'm fighting this battle called Waterloo. And then they could come back an hour later and say, you, you know, say oh, no, I'm, I'm not Napoleon. What are you talking about? And then they could let me drive home. I wouldn't mind that. FDR, President Roosevelt, uh, was a master at speaking on the radio, but he had a, a terrible sinus condition. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> and when those sinuses stopped up his navel, nasal passages, you're probably too young. You remember Daffy Duck? Have you ever seen yeah. Daffy Duck? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's how he sounded on the radio. So, so all doctors carried cocaine in their, I mean, you could go to the drugstore and get Coca-Cola, right? We talked about that, right? You know what they call Coca-Cola? Because it had cocaine in it. If you're drooping kind of at the end of the day and you're going back to the office, you can say, gee, I'll just stop and have a Coke. Just pick you right up. You can finish the rest of the work day. That was perfectly legal in a beer. That's why they call it Coca-Cola. We didn't do that. Well, that's why they called it Coca-Cola. It had cocaine in it. The original Coke had cocaine in it. But uh, Roosevelt, when he had, he had to make an address and he had that sign, his doctor would just take a Q-tip and, you know, pull his medical bag open, dip it in, and swab his nasal passages with cocaine. It just open right up. Huh? I guess, yeah. Uh, but it wasn't like, well, you know, that's what people think. I heard that on a radio show. They said, which president used cocaine? And somebody called this and said, oh, they were all, and they said, oh, it was Franklin Roosevelt. And they made it, it was disc jockeys, you know, how they are. It made it sound like Roosevelt you know, was, 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 was snorting. It made it sound like Roosevelt was snorting cocaine. You know, when he woke up the next person, we bombed who? You know, but no, it wasn't like that. It was a medical procedure, and everybody, all sorts of people had that medical procedure. Like I say, heroin wasn't made illegal until 1984. If your baby had colic, you know what colic is? Your baby wouldn't stop puking. And you just, you know, pat a little puking, you get tired of it, you'd take it, and they would give the baby heroin. Okay, they wouldn't object it, but they, huh? Aren't heroin and morphine like the same thing? I mean, about, yeah, roughly, yeah. And morphine is still, of course, legal, but uh, it was legal until 1984. Okay, um, but anyway, um, by the way, in the 20s, cocaine was so popular. One of the top 10 songs that the young, the lost generation they were dancing to was called Cocaine Habit. Here's a verse from Cocaine Habit. Uh, I love my whiskey, I love my gin, but the way I love my Coke is the dad gone sin, okay? That's what the youth were dancing to in the 1920s. It was very, very, uh, it was very, very popular, okay? Well, so, but the, but, but the uh, uh, government outlawed alcohol, get this down, and like I say, when you make something, get this down, when you make something illegal, there are plenty of people who are willing to supply you with whatever has been made illegal. And the reason that, I'll say it again, the reason that prohibition failed is the same reason that the drug war today has failed. People, Americans want drugs. And alcohol is a drug. I get tired of these people saying, oh, you know, uh, alcohol and we're going to have a, an alcohol and drug assembly. No, you're going to have a drug assembly. Alcohol is the most destructive drug in history. You could take all the victims of Oxycontin, all the victims of cocaine and heroin and, methamp and methamphetamines and ecstasy, and you could stack all those bodies in one field, and then you could stack all the lives ruined and people that died of alcohol consumption, and it would just dwarf uh, the dead from all those other drugs. And what have we done with the deadliest drug in history? And that's what alcohol is. It's the deadliest. We've put it in a store, and all you have to have, listen, when you turn 21, you can back up to the extreme liquor, liquor store, and they will sell you the whole inventory if you can pay for it. And that's what we've done with the deadliest drug in history. 
Well, so they outlawed alcohol, but there were ways around that. Get this down. Soon saloons were opening illegal saloons in the back alleys of America. In the back alleys of America, illegal saloons were opening in this country. <clears throat> You've seen movies. Oh, there's a girl doing the Charleston. You know, I saved and saved and sent my daughter to college, and my God, look what she's doing. Dancing on top of a table at a fraternity house. Oh, my God. Uh, Anheuser-Busch. That's another way they got rid of alcohol. We were fighting the Germans in World War I. All the big brewers, that's German. That's not Irish. Anheuser-Busch. They are still the biggest producers of booze in the world. You're not sitting. Have any of you been to Bush Gardens up in St. Louis? You're just sitting five or six hours away from the biggest distillery in the world. But it was German, and that gave it a bad name. Uh, Con Coors Beer. Uh, Conrad Coors, the, the original Coors that came here were the Coors brothers. That was too German, so in World War I, they changed it to Coors. But anything German was poisoned during World War I, and the prohibitionists used that argument as well to get rid of booze. Of course, there's good old Coca-Cola. There's some statistics. There are some prohibition agents that have confiscated some barrels of beer, and they're pouring it down the drain. Uh, there's some more booze going down the drain. They have raids all throughout the 20s. <clears throat> there's some cops. That guy's looking at that bottle of whatever it is like, hello, old friend. It makes me think that he maybe had confiscated that himself. And by the way, police often did that in the 20s. It's like some police. I don't want to talk, but some law enforcement officials will do a drug bust, and they'll take part of the drug bust, and they'll sell it private. Not very many do that, but some do. In the 20s, that was pretty rampant. But anyway, they opened these illegal saloons. You've all seen the movies. Look at that guy. He slid that little thing back. You come up and knock on the door, and he slid that little thing back. And uh, what did you have to do to get into the saloon? You had to give him the password so he would know you weren't the what? The cops. That's exactly right. So he would open it and look at you, and then he would lean his ear, and you had to whisper it. You don't want the password to get out. Uh in, in, in public, uh, so maybe the cops could use it to bust your illegal saloon. So because you had to whisper the password, get this down, these illegal saloons of the 1920s were called speakeasies. Speakeasies. And they were in the rundown section of town. Everybody that wanted a drink knew where they were. Uh, you would see a limousine pull up in a place with turned over trash cans and this Guy would get out of a tuxedo and his date would have an evening gown and they would stroll down this dirty alley with stray cats and they would finally come to a stairway leading down and they would go up to a battered old beat up door that just looked like a basement and they would whisper the password and then they would go in and there they are inside the speakeasy. It was quite a swanky place, yes. So what was the punishment you got? You could go to prison. Yeah, yeah. For selling it, for consuming it, you probably just had to pay a fine. You might spend a little bit in jail, but if you ran a speaking, there's another speaking. Look at that. That's you know that's what it looked like once you got inside. Well dressed people, and a lot of them. That's prohibition. In fact, get this down. Uh, after prohibition, to show you how the drug war failed, a year uh, after the alcohol uh, war failed. Uh, a year after prohibition went into effect, there were 10,000, get this down, 10,000 speakeasies in Chicago alone. And in New York City, they had 30,000 speakeasies. Look, there were all sorts of ways around prohibition. One of the first problems, get this down, look at the borders of the United States. How do you, look at that, how do you control the borders of the United States? And look, you know, Canada to the north of us, they didn't have prohibition. So you could just drive across the border. Mexico didn't have prohibition. How in the world? You know, here the United States is sitting in the middle of this. If they close down your saloon, this actually happened. If they close down your saloon up here in Boston, you can just take everything, all your slot machines, all your booze, and you can just put it out on a charter boat. You just sail out in Boston Harbor about three miles. Once you're out three miles, you're out of the United States and just drop anchor and then run little boats back and forth and bring your customers out there on the weekend. And on those charter boats, they have prostitution, drugs, gambling, alcohol, you name it. Go out there and spend the weekend, 
sleep it off Sunday night, get on a charter boat, go back, you know, clean up, shave, put on a new suit, and go back and work at your business on Monday. And there was not a thing the government could do about that. Okay? College boys, get this down, made booze in their dorm rooms in their bathtubs. Bathtub gin. They ran still in there. Bathtub gin. Although, let me say this, just like today, you know, if you can't afford fine cut cocaine today, you can always go to the local meth dealer. But you better know your dealer because you don't know what he's putting in that stuff. You know, what do they say? And this may all be wives' tales, old wives. I used to buy wormer for my dogs at the feed store. Can't do it anymore. I've got to have a prescription because apparently the meth dealers grind up wormer for dogs in their product. They say they put... We've got a list of things here. They uh, they say that they put, and this all may be an old wives' tale. <laughs> but anyway, um, rat poison, hydrochloric acid, brake fluid, iodine, Drano, they say they use all that. And by the way, you can make meth just about anywhere. It's not that long ago. These people were driving up I-35 south of Norman. There had to be a highway patrol there the trunk of their car caught on fire and the guy pulled them over and they were running a meth lab in the back of their car as they were driving down the road. So uh, you better know your, you better know your drug dealer uh, because uh, what you get could kill you. You know, it could be laced with fentanyl or anything. It could kill you stone slab dead. Well, guess what? Booze was the same way. It was easy and cheap to make and it could kill you. There was one popular, you better know your bootlegger, just like you better know your drug dealer. Uh, there was a thing called Jamaica ginger. If you drank that, uh, you know, you might wake up in the morning 20 years old and for the rest of your life, drag it, paralyze you, drag your leg like this. They call that Jake leg. There was another one called Jackass Brandy. Really cheap. You're going to the frat party, oh, I'm going to go buy a couple of bottles of Jackass Brandy and spike the punch. You drink that. Next morning you get up, you're not feeling too good. <laughs> Stand in front of the mirror and you put your hand down, it's got blood. Uh, that was already eating up your internal organs. It would kill you. Uh, they sold stuff that would make you call, uh, that would make you go blind. So you imagine that. Go to a party and you can't focus the next day. And by Wednesday, you're blind. Uh, so people ran the risk. But I'll tell you what, get this down. <coughs> Regardless like today, regardless of what teachers and red ribbon assemblies and preachers and parents and all these people warned you about, it became, it became, somebody told me the latest slogan, pushing the P. Is that it? Yeah. Is that it? Did I get it right? When I said uh, somebody told me P line, I was saying P line, it's pushing the P. Pushing the P. I, you know, well, I've just been listening to uh, Little Baby too much, you know, and so I, uh, it's my favorite artist. I actually listened to him yesterday, you know, uh, it made me want to drive a pencil through my throat, but anyway, it should, you know, uh, if you listen to the music I listen to, it make you want to drive a pencil through your throat. I need anyway. the junior class officers to report to the library. Anyway, just a second. Um... Regardless of what all these people said in the 20s, it became cool to get busted. If your fraternity got busted, you were the big men on campus. By the way, what was the word? You might want to try this. In fact, I wish you'd start that. Uh, you might start a new trend for the Gen Zers. What was the word for cool? You know, if you got busted and got your picture on the paper, everybody said, God, look at that guy. What a party. That guy's really cool. He's a big man on campus. What was the word for cool in the 1920s? You were the cat's meow. Cats me out. Don't look like that. You may want to try it. Next time you see something, if you hear a song, you need to listen to Lil Baby. He's the cat's me out. I don't think I'd ever be allowed to show my face here. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the little man on cats. God. I saw this girl on
that's yours. Mm -hmm. You might pick it up, throw it away on your way out. Anybody need to go anywhere?
afternoon, everybody. I need to see all my kids in my office real quick. Terrence McNeil, Jacob McNeely, Brooke Lane, Shelby Lenore, and Sean Kiley. You guys come to the office real quick. Also, your daily reminder about your tardies and your attendance. Uh, if you think you need a Saturday school, you know, you're going to be absent and you're already at your limit, you can let me know and make one up. I've got one scheduled for this Saturday. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. See you later. following students in the library with their Chromebooks, Tristan Branham, Kaylee Birch, Kelsey Byrne, Kiersey Colbert, Wyatt Elkins, Jordan Allen, Sean Hunter, Evan Lane, Briar Lanham, Isaac Lanham, Damian McCauley, Terrence McNeil, Cody McNeil, Mason Rose, Kyle Ward, and Hayden Knight. I also need Jackson Anderson in the library with his crumb.